your show's rubbish. I could do it like that. I don't no, know. Do it like that. Okay. Ooh, welcome to the D Trout Spinners. Um, special episode today. I would just well, let's get the formalities out of the way. I'm Gary. This is Miles. Miles likes Hello. to his name, so it's Miles Pennell. But we have just, we've actually just done it. Recorded an interview with Laurie Peters, and some of you might know the name from Pilkopedia. He's listed. He's kind of He's an animator, a designer, an illustrator, an artist, but he's basically a childhood friend of Carl Pilkington. He was friends, they were friends since secondary school. They're still friends today. And yeah, so we we interviewed him. We asked him all sorts of stuff about Carl and growing up and the stories from Carl's past, how Carl is today. It was it was a fascinating interview, Miles, wasn't it? It was just really, it's a pleasure to do. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I actually have to take a moment to calm down because I'm actually a little bit too excited. Um, I, I need to like go for a long walk or sit by a fire or something. I don't know. Well, this is or cry. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I listen um detroutees i hope you all enjoy this episode because we certainly did and i look forward to yeah hearing what what you think of the episode yeah here it is here is laurie peters today miles we have a very special guest with us he is a talented artist designer animator illustrator and most importantly for our podcast, <laughs> childhood friend and still friends to this day with Carl Pilkington. He is Laurie Peters. Laurie, thanks for sitting down and doing this with us. Much appreciated. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Um, just want to take you back to the very beginning, really, like how it all began. When did you first meet Carl? Where was it and how old were you? And did you hit it off straight away as friends? So I come from the area where Carl's from. So it's the northwest of, northwest of England um, mm. in a place in Greater Manchester. And um, yeah, I think maybe the first time I met him was when we had a paper round together. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So that was probably the first time I met him. And um, I think he may have shown me where to get free cakes from because there was a place nearby where if you oh. climbed over a wall or if you got on the bit <laughs> yeah, 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 back. 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 so I think he might have told me about that but um, he used to get there very early earlier than me most of the time so I just couldn't be arsed but um, he used to get there early so he could get home and watch uh, uh, cartoons like Pink Panther and stuff like that, and I just, I just used to say to them, I just can't be asked meeting you at six a.m. in the morning, which is just ridiculous. <laughs> so um, yeah, he's always been one for getting up early and um, and cracking on. Um, he's still a bit like that now. But then um, school, yeah, we went to school to, you know, we sat in the same classes. Um, this is primary school or secondary? No, school? No, this was secondary school, a school okay. called Ashton on Mersey. And um, we sat together on most classes. You know, we'd annoy each other, throw stuff at each other, fight. Yeah, at break times we'd fight. It would either be me and him fighting. And, and I think we had another mate as well that that, that used to help beat up Carl. <laughs> or it used to be the other way around. Carl would be beating me up with our mate. And, um, and it would just alternate like that every break time. <laughs> so it's a bit like stupid. I remember... Ricky asked me about that and um, he wanted some insight and I told him that and um, he said Carl never seemed to have a problem when he would wrestle him to the ground naked, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> was a bit weird. Um, That's Ricky. So, That's yeah. <laughs> and then after school, you know, he never really completed school. Um, he just wanted to do radio. I, I went off uh, to art college and... Um, you know, we met up a bit later in the 90s. Then uh, 2004, I think we met again, and that's when we started working together. And, um, yeah, there's a load of stuff that happened around that time up until now. Yeah, interesting. So you've known him for, say, 30, well, I don't want to give you age, but, yeah, so 30, 35? 
Yeah, five thirty five years. Has he has he kind of is he the same kind of Carl you knew back then? Has he changed much as a person since being a child? No, not really. He's still got the same level of intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's he's still the same pretty much. You know, he's a bit smarter. I wouldn't say he's got more intelligent. I'd say he's definitely smarter. I mean, he's learned by a lot of his mistakes. And, you know, even going back to the bakery thing, he ate too many cakes. And even now he talks about it. Like if we play a game of golf too much, you will say you can't have too much of a good thing. And I'm like, what are you on about? It goes, you know, cakes and that. And, and you know, and he's, he's just harping back the stuff yeah. he's learned and um, does apply him today, which is quite sweet, I guess. But um, that's, that's nice that he kind of talks about those stories because he talks about... Um, having too many cakes on the podcast and uh he says the doctor told his mum that he was going to die but he, he she was he was just messing around but it's not <laughs> kind of actually he doesn't just tell them on the on the show for the sake of it he kind of they are genuinely prominent things in his mind yeah absolutely and i mean his mum i didn't have too much of a relationship with his dad his dad was quite sharp and quite to the point and quite mm. strict and he didn't take any messing about i mean you know it's quite short with me on occasions but his mom's mm. very nice um oh. I remember his dad walking down his house and his 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 old man pulled up in his taxi and i said <sighs> it's carlin just a young child and he goes i don't bloody know knock on the bloody door <laughs> you know, that's so like, it sounds right, Carl's, Carl's dad sounds like an absolute character from the stories that he says uh, in the XFM shows. You know, like at once he slapped Carl for not liking a castle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, he was quite strict and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised by that. I mean, I know that he worries a bit more these days as they get older and he calls them nearly every day, I think, and yeah. checks up on them. I think his, it was funny, his mum... The other week, um, it's quite funny. He's, he rang him up and she was a bit ill. And, um, you know, he asked more questions about why she was ill. And it's down to the fact that she'd frozen a KFC. <laughs> so it's, you don't freeze KFCs, Mum, or um, Dad picking mushrooms on the golf course and then eating them and saying there was a weird blue glow when he was. Um, heating them up in the oven so you know he does worry about them <laughs> that's, that's, life, that's life up north that's life up north yeah. for you well what was it like growing up with him like in in like manchester because obviously on the shows and this is a podcast about the xfm show he tells some absolutely incredible anecdotes of of life growing up and you know like you said how much he remembers it's it's, it's crazy he's got this exceptional yeah. you know memory and, and imagination as well how much of that was true like the stories about you know horse in the house <laughs> i don't know yeah. how just... i remember that house and I yeah are you aware of the door. xfm shows laurie yeah just, just, yeah so you have listened to them so you know his anecdotes i just wanted to check that so a yeah a few of them a few of them i've listened to um i do know about the horse i think it was an irish family there were a couple of doors down and i do remember that horse knocking about the house yeah <laughs> knocking about and, um, and also, like, I just remember the smell around there because Carl lived on an estate called the Racecourse Estate, and my estate was opposite. And my estate was like a posh estate, if you like. It was a more newer estate, whereas mm. the Racecourse is kind of rough. But everyone liked Carl, do you know what I mean? So he was never in trouble. I, I would always feel very a bit wary about walking onto his estate to knock for him because it was kind of like badlands i just always remember it smelling shit because not because it was a bad estate but because there was a there's a horse there, <laughs> there, there was a horse and there was a sewage <laughs> plant about half a mile across oh, the road that. from his house and yeah. it just every summer it just reeked oh. and, and, all, and all the characters that he talks about were probably true i mean there was some mental people on that i don't know if you can say that anymore but there was some pretty mad characters yeah his kids there. chase cars apparently it's yeah chase, i mean I there was um a funeral on that estate on the pub next to his house a few months back and it was a friend of ours from school oh. and um they had the they had the is it the wake where they or the reception thing where they go to a pub afterwards and eat and drink well this is how mad it is on that estate before everyone had piled into the pub to eat the food. The kids from the estate had left school 
knew there was a funeral on, so he walked into the pub and just ate all the food and left. <laughs> free so, funeral food. Everyone got So, so you had the free food. you had the free cakes, that's your dessert. Go to the funeral and wait for your main course. That's like the twenty twenty version of um climbing over a wall and getting free cakes is going to a funeral of someone you yeah, don't this is it. They so, knew where to go for this food and there was and then he just ransacked the buffet and uh they all got there. I'm like, what are these kids doing? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there was a lot of, um, you know, there was a lot of people around on the estate that we knew, and a lot of them become quite well known in the industry, or they went on to do quite, you know, great things. I mean, there was an athlete, I think, that Carl used to knock about with. I forget oh, his name. Darren. Um, Darren, Darren Campbell. Yeah. Darren Darren Campbell. Campbell. Used, to, used to see him around, and there was a few other heads that we knew. That really did all right. He's come well, to London, I guess, to take yeah. a risk. You've all you've all moved away, but from that sort of as you call it a rough area, yours area was slightly less rough. Carl was yeah. sort of famously told on the show he'd never be a high flyer at school, so I can't mm. imagine the school was that good at, at pushing sort of children to their limits and yeah I, we, but I, you've got all these high achievers including you and Carl and Dan Campbell and all these people so what do you think was it about that place that I'm, I'm not sure the curriculum it? I'm not sure if there was such a thing as a curriculum back there where they had to follow a number of steps and tick a number of boxes I really don't I think they were just they knew they had to teach algebra to a bunch of kids and mm. they had a go at it and if it didn't work out, you know, I don't think we were, it was an odd school really. I'm not sure why we didn't get the information we were supposed to get, but it was a long time ago and it's somehow a little bit blurry in my mind. Uh, Carl says once in one of his anecdotes, one of the teachers had a bunch of catalogues for Thompson yeah. and he had to scroll out the, the date and write the, the newer date because they, they, all, no, put, they put think put stickers on with the newer date. Put yeah, because they might be getting like a free holiday out of it. <laughs> Do you remember that? Right. Primary that was history. That was geography. <laughs> geography, right. Um, he took geography. I didn't. Yeah, um, I mean, we did um, what we did English and art, and we were in the form class every year. Commerce, where I nearly set myself alight, or he nearly set me alight, or something. Our listeners and myself, obviously, we've, we're really fascinated by Carl Pugeton as, as a character. I was just wondering, like, how much of his character? Obviously, you've known him, but as he's grown up, and um, I wondered how much has he changed? Like you mentioned, like obviously he becomes probably he's probably become a bit more self-aware, I suppose. And obviously, working in the media, you've got that media training. I just wondered how much of the the persona that we know of him, because we're we're obviously not friends with him, though I'd love to be friends with him. Um, he he <laughs> is pretty much that person, except I would say that probably at the time when he started to travel with Warwick I felt that he had become very aware of the persona that people expect him to put on mm. so I think he became aware of it at that point that, and he was able to turn it on a little bit more than just by being himself he was just able to switch it on a little bit more so I think he is like that but he just he's able to turn it up and a little bit if he wants to exaggerate slightly sort yeah of exactly yeah i mean I, I you know with all that stuff as well with the idiot abroad stuff i remember the time you know i used to go to london and hang out and stuff and uh, I, I know he had a hard time over that stuff mm. um it was it was quite funny but like coming back and he was just covered in bites and <laughs> seeing it like he was just like oh my dad's pissed off with me doesn't want me to do it anymore and he's, he's been in Africa nearly broken his back jumping off that thing <laughs> that he jumped off yeah I mean he still yeah. today so struggles funny. he still today struggles with that he's got a bad back now and he has to wear a brace because because he's jumped off like a step oh yeah it's <laughs> one step he doesn't even do it from the top does he he comes right down to do it Right. But he's always so, he's always had like a kind of an older man's mindset though, hasn't he? He's always totally different. Yeah, I I do often tell him to slow down because he just acts like he's retired, and uh, I'm like, whoa, whoa, you know, like we're not there yet. So yeah, he is. He's got an older head on him, um, you know, like he likes a cup of tea with his chips and his fish or whatever, and oh. you know things like that, little things that just seem to come from. A, like another time almost. <laughs> I love um, it. I love it. But Carl always seems the sort of person who would be more comfortable in a time time gone by, you know, 
years yonder sort of like he's not he's I can't see him sort of engaging very much with the modern world it's certainly if Ricky hadn't no. forced him to do all those things and gone to other places he would not have left Britain probably he, he does have that mentality a little bit still in that he doesn't really want to like if we go and have a game of golf mm. I mean he just wants to play the same golf course I mean every week and I say Carl this golf course is shit I mean it's that <laughs> bad Carl had to play a shot over a burnt out car on the fourth <laughs> hole once that had been robbed that had been robbed it was upside down and it was still hot and it was in the middle of the golf course and Carl just played a chip over it it was hilarious <laughs> That's quite I've talented. Got, uh, skip over it. <laughs> I've got a clip actually. I'll share it with you. I bet. I bet even that didn't phase him though. The sort of stories up north. He was like, oh, makes sense. Yeah. No. <laughs> it's not the golf course. Yeah. So course, yeah, he perhaps. does like to do pretty much the same thing over and over again, and he sees it as mastering something, which you know you can kind of agree with. And then there's, mm-hmm. you know, the times when I have taken him to a golf course, he's like, oh, I'm sick of this, and then he'll play really badly, and he'll try and ruin my game or drive the golf buggy into a post or just like it's quite funny to watch but it's uh it's just because he likes the things he likes and that's it you know <laughs> very very particular about yeah what he does and doesn't do which is so funny to think that he's been to probably more countries than most people in the world because of uh idiot abroad yeah. You know, yeah. he's done all this stuff he didn't want to do. Like most people would love to have that chance, but for Carl, it's like, what's for tea? Exactly. You know? you know, I don't think he cooks, so you're right, and that is the question he would ask. Yeah, what's for tea? I mean, uh, he was telling me that he remembers when he got the Idiot Abroad gig, he was putting up some curtains around his mate's house, and the phone call went and said, you've got this thing when you go around the world. And he was just ecstatic and you know really happy and i said what did you celebrate did you go out to get some champagne and he's like no i just went in and got like some fish and chips and you know so yeah bringing it down so what's yeah. the time he was excited about getting that gig because he always moans about how yeah. much he didn't want to do it the, the idea of it was probably slightly different to what it ended up like i, I mean, think ricky and steve probably yeah. pitched it to him without the details about how he would be like abused in each yeah. country and all the things they'll do to <laughs> I imagine. Yeah, I mean, it was lucky that, you know, in a sense, when when me and Carl, about 2004, started animating prior to Idiot Abroad and all that kind of thing, he was at XFM and he was working with Ricky and Steve on the on the, on the thing they were doing. And then um, we, we wanted to try animation, so we did this animation called Cat Mop, which was probably talked about on the XFM shows where... Mm-hmm. Carl makes up these inventions and I would animate them anyway. So we put that to an agency and he, we were interviewed kind of thing by Russell Brand in a room and Carl got signed pretty much there and then by oh, Russell right. Brand. So, really? Yeah, in 2005, I think. So that was the idea that we'd get these animations out there and we would get on TV. So uh, he got signed and Russell said, you know, I don't think Laurie wants to be signed. And I was like, no, I don't. I'm not a comedian, but I can work with yeah. you guys, kind of thing. Yeah. So then, Carl, then me and Carl got offered uh, Bo Selector, Bo Selector gig. So Carl wanted to do that kind of thing with me, and we got seven animations. We got kind of like asked to do with Lee Francis, and um, oh. we only did one because me and Carl got sick of it, and then Carl wanted out, and he's like, "I'm sick of this," you know. Yeah, sick so of got it. Sick of it quite quickly. And well, then, it's something um, new. He didn't like it because it's not like having fish and chips for tea and it's like a new gig. He had so much on probably and it was just another yeah. headache for him. So then we'd say, well, we'll do something else. And we came up with this idea, which kind of ended up as the Ricky Gervais show. So mm. Ricky wanted to do talking in a room and then do the same idea we had as we just kind of zoom off into Carl's head and whatever he's thinking. And that's the thing we worked on for a little bit. And in between that, I do stuff on the culture show with Carl. Mm. And then I work with Ricky on the extras thing. I did some animation for Ricky on extras. Yeah. And then they wanted to go big. And unfortunately, you know, a one man band can't really do an HBO, yeah. you know, Ricky Gervais show. So I kind of, me and Carl put um, a pitch together to make it look like Paddington Bear, which is a very kind of cow style show. Mm. And it, it was quite sweet and it was quite funny. And 
uh, and it was nostalgic at the same time. It was good. Um, it took about two weeks to do. And I remember having, because it was quite a small set and you had to cut everything out, we had all these kind of, I had to buy all these little tiny pots and pans for the set. And uh, I got them off eBay. And the woman who I bought them was giving me so much hassle about me <laughs> letting her have feedback. She wanted all this feedback oh. all the time about how good a little pot sort of pans and Carl's like asking me how it's getting on. I was saying, you know, I'm getting stressed out here by this this uh, woman on eBay. She wants feedback. He says, look, I'll take care of that. So he says about this feedback to this woman saying, do not buy from a pots and pans. They're not real size. Oh, really. <laughs> do you still have that available? The Paddington Bear stuff? Um, it might be knocking about somewhere on one of my drives. It was, um, the test was... Um, we use the audio from the fridge. I don't know if you've ever seen the fridge. I love that video. Because around about the time I filmed a couple of those ones, which was the one of him in the zoo, the um, museum. Oh, you well filmed as... that? Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is it, um, Laurie, what, what is it like sort of obviously being friends and but then sort of creatively collaborating? That's a completely different style of relationship. And I... I just wondered what how that sort of worked. What is he like to work with? Who sort? How do you get on with like the idea generation? Um, and the, the execution. Is he quite a perfectionist? He obviously seems quite a perfectionist and someone yeah. who's very much like an auteur of his own work. Yeah. He can go anywhere to get anything he wants. There was a time a while back when I was asked to do music for Moaning of Life and stuff, and we'd worked together on that and creating just ideas, which never really went anywhere, like 30, 40 tracks. Mm. after um i can't remember his name he did the music in the end um oh, but anyway uh, vic sharma vic sharma vic sharma yeah vic sharma did it and then um we tried doing music for sick of it but the majority of the time you know it's animation and the way we work together is really quite loose you know i'll just get a message off him saying you know what would I look like if I was a spy or something like that? And I'd go, what are you talking about? And I would just ignore him for about a week or two weeks. Yeah. And then he'll bring it up again. And then he'll give me more of an insight of what he's thinking. And then I'll try to draw it. And I'll probably do several executions and maybe throw in some pictures that I've seen on the net of of people with round heads or whatever. And then uh, he'll, he'll go... <laughs> He'll go, yeah, I like that, or he won't say anything on, or he'll just, he'll choose, he'll pick and pull from things, and then he'll finally say, I've not seen that before like that. Or he'll have a good reason for why he likes a certain art direction style. Yeah. And then from there, I will say, record me some audio. And then he'll usually pick up on a subject that's rattling around in his head, or a number of subjects, and he'll just record it in his house on his phone. That was the last gig anyway. That was the last thing that we did. He's, he's incredibly creative. And we talk about his intelligence and he talked about it on the show. And Ricky talks about it and it's always put down. But really, he Carl has a lot of hidden intelligence. And I can imagine that as an animator working with him, with someone so creative, because he is very creative, just thinking, oh, yeah, what would I look like as a spy? And most people don't say that or think that in their head. But yeah. it must be quite rewarding, I guess, just from a, being an animator, because I guess you are also quite creative. It's a very creative profession. Sort of you fit together quite nicely. In yeah, that. we've got a similar sense of humour in a way, although mine's a little bit darker and sometimes he has to kind of like rein that back and say look if you put that in there you will get killed or something you know yeah. <laughs> or just leave that out or just take that out Laurie. you've gone a bit too far or I'll try things that are a little bit edgy and maybe I'll rein them in a little bit because he's a lot more smarter maybe with what you can and what you can't do but yeah it is good creative relationship that I've got with Carl He's a little bit frustrating in that he's not very tech savvy. He doesn't no. like new things like, I don't know, Twitch or new platforms. No, I can't. He doesn't like me using the word uh, functions, TikTok. for instance. <laughs> I can you relate, know, I, actually. <laughs> you know, when I say functions, he'll go, oh, here we go. You know, and, and you know, I, <laughs> no matter how much I explain things to him, there's a there's a limit to what he's prepared to listen to about what I'm trying to say. So I've got to keep it quite like loose and um, mm. kind of playful and not too heavy with Carl. I try and keep it light 
and um, we just tried to do the best work that we can when we work together. The last bit of work that we did, he was very happy with. Uh, he, he was Some really the KP happy radio with, stuff. Yeah, he wanted to go back to a kind of, you know, radio type thing, and we wanted to get it away with, I don't know, a new platform like Spotify or something. But then yeah. COVID, COVID just took out advertising yeah. budgets completely and um you know nowadays because he's these television um, appearances it would seem that a lot of sponsorship and things like that would really prefer to have his actual face appearing so it didn't really lend its work you know itself too well to the industry that that particular job but you know we can't foresee everything some things are a success and some things aren't yeah and, a lot of time than not. <laughs> it's, it's funny though because he's obviously quite a technically kind of savvy person because you know working in a being head of production at XFM and you know coming up with like mm. jingles and like trails yeah. and stuff like it's quite a it's a technically demanding job you there's a lot have to buttons. have a certain level of expertise there's a lot of buttons you've got to know which every button does yeah yeah, he, was good, good he did enjoy that. He, although towards the end, even though he's head of production, I think he just used to lock himself in a room and just sound bites and jingles. I don't think he even wanted to do so for me. He just was like, oh, what's this shit, you know? I think that's what made it so good was that he didn't want to, he wasn't seeking it. He wasn't seeking fame. He wasn't seeking kind of success in that sense as a presenter. And I, I think that's what makes it so kind of real yeah. and down to earth as a show. I, it seems a weird question to ask you, but I wanted to ask, like, what has he ever like disclosed? And do feel free to say as much or as little as you want. <laughs> but what is his? Um, does he ever talk about his like relationship with Ricky and Steve? And yeah, how does yeah. He, obviously yeah. they do so much well. together. Yeah. So there's a there's an often a thing knocking about about Ricky falling out with Carl and all the rest of it. But the thing you need to understand about the creative industry is that if you're not from mates from a long time ago, you work with each other and then that's pretty much it. On yeah. radio, on TV, you will seem like best mates. If you're in comedy, you'll look like even more best mates because you're laughing off one another. But when Ricky did his Brent tour with the music, mm -hmm. at that point, Ricky was getting into music. Now, Carl, he didn't want to do that. So that's at the point where they stop working with each other. So that would also be the point of where they would have seen each other less. They maybe would have talked to each other less. But ultimately, they've not fallen out. Don't work with each other. And Ricky is like yeah. seriously busy guy. I mean, I don't know how he does what he does. But um, no, he still sees Steve Merchant when he comes over. If Steve's <laughs> over, then Carl will see Steve. Yeah. That's nice to know. I don't know why that's quite comforting. I'm glad. I don't think Carl sees or speaks to Ricky that much. They're just because of Ricky's schedule. Yeah, he's just so busy and stuff. But no, they're, you know, they're still mates and that, I think. But, you know, if they work together, I don't think what they did back then, it would work today in the sense that no. I don't think it would have the same kind of dynamic, but there might mm. be some stories there that Carl could tell and it would still seem funny. But, Carl, you know, Ricky just laying into him every 10 seconds. Would it work? I don't know. I don't know. No, I don't think <laughs> discussed this on our show quite a bit actually would it work now because quite a few of the fans of the show who listen to our show say they'd wish that they would all get into a room together again but i don't know i i don't think i think it's that's that's in the past and that's done it's had its time it, and i agree with you it wouldn't kind of work now now they've all got public profiles but back then when yeah. they were far less famous all of them far less successful it's kind of it was more raw it wouldn't be I think it would be a bit too polished now yeah possibly yeah it would seem a bit more contrived possibly mm. and people would be expecting maybe something that they might not be able to give so yeah it, it could be yeah that might be right Talk, talking about that in that obviously how he was in the radio and and how he is now does it ever surprise you his level of popularity and as Carl sort of is he surprised by the level of popularity that he's like gathered? Because I've yeah. heard him talk about, you know, the XFM show. He can't believe that people still listen to the shows and he's but he's talked quite, you know, really warmly about them. What's Yeah. Popularity. Yeah, so, I mean, he never really talked about, you know, the life that he leads now that much because 
I know enough about it, but to kind of, I can see in him, he's had to live with it. And, you know, for years and years now, that it's almost like we have a kind of a behaviour that we have to do when we're out. So if we go for a meal, Carl will just like march off in front of me and he will find a spot that is most secluded. So he's backs away from everyone. And he'll sit down. Yeah. And I'll have to bring in the menu and then I'll go to the bar or whatever and order and stuff like that. So there is a kind of routine and there's things because we know that the, that the popularity is there and sometimes it attracts the right loons. I mean, I've seen where, you know, headlocks and taking you pictures, joking. you know, like, you know, yeah, going, ah, right, mate, and just like... Because Ricky did it. it. They think it's OK. They think it, they exactly. could just squeeze his head as well. Yeah, I, and I've seen that. I mean, I've seen it where... Was it a screening for um, sick of it? There was this guy who um, had some kind of a disability that Carl had given free access to the screening, and he came with his mum. He just kept saying to Carl, "You've got an head like a fucking orange or something like that." And he was like, oh, "Fuck off, you cheeky twat!" And then he just kept laying it on to Carl. And I say that's because they think because they've done it to you before that they can do it now. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, but then again, people are very nice to him. Like when we go for golf or out for drinks and stuff like that, or a meal, people know him and and, and they're just nice to him. Ninety percent of the time, ninety nine percent mm. of the time, really. So being that popular and have people be that nice to you is. It's quite. It, it, must, it must be quite nice, but I don't think he's that, he's that asked about it really. <laughs> it's, it's, do you know who that will delight? Ricky Gervais. The fact that people come up and give him headlocks and sort of squeeze his head. As Ricky always said, he wanted. That's what he wanted. He wanted Carl to never be able to go anywhere without someone squeezing his head and <laughs> saying it looks like a fucking orange. I mean, walking through London at Christmas used to be a nightmare for him. I know that. I mean, I've walked through London with them once at Christmas and people are like, ah, Carl, I'd like a fucking husband. And then because they're all pissed, like they're all pissed up at Christmas and all happy. They're just outside bars. Yeah. <laughs> you just got to cross the road. You've got to cross the road. Otherwise, you know, you're just going to get in trouble. Um, <laughs> have, have, but, you, have you ever squeezed Carl's head? <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, have, I have put him in a, I have put him in a naked chokehold. <laughs> <laughs> which is just, which is something where you can put someone to sleep. <laughs> and, uh, we, was that in we, Soho? No, that was that was on the golf course actually. We were talking about martial arts because I do Aikido, and I was trying to get him over, and he was like, "Yeah, but you know, I, I could hurt someone and all this." <laughs> and I was like, well, and he calls it um, Cardo, or he calls it IKEA. He doesn't call it I, Aikido. He always makes up some word. But I said, no, look, honestly, you can do something really easy on someone. And I went behind him and I did this choke on him. He's like, ah! <laughs> it's the most ridiculous sound. Uh, yeah, I nearly knocked him out at one point. But, you know. <laughs> have it, but, uh, um, Laurie, Laurie, have you met Suzanne? That's such a... Yeah, this, this is going to sound weird to you. But in all my life, I have never met her. I have heard her. I've heard her voice over the phone probably mainly met Carl but I've never <laughs> ever met her because she's outside I think that's one of the things that Carl likes to keep really on yeah. Is, is, yeah. Is yeah that is her I mean I think she's met Ricky and all that but you know I've not met her I've, I've I often like ask him you know but he's like I oh, just keep it there just keep it there leave it out you know kind of yeah thing. so I think if maybe if I lived near him you yeah know, and we went out then maybe he'd bring her or whatever but um, I've, I've not lived near enough to socialise in that way. I think it's really nice that um, because I remember in one story Carl was talking about um, you know, having to walk really, really fast because Ricky was chasing him, trying to find out. Person, it's lovely that yeah. people can maintain that level of privacy, particularly in this era now, where everyone wants to to know your name and your and everyone's you know, got a camera. About- everyone's can yeah, film anything at any moment, but there's no everyone's pictures of Suzanne out there, and I think that's telling. You know, yeah. good as to how he, you know, wants to keep that part of his life private. Yeah. And um, I think I did find a picture of him once online and I just put it to him and he just smiled. So I think I might know which was. Oh, maybe there's <laughs> one. Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, that, that, that is true about Ricky chasing him because I, I know that car used to live in a flat on um, Percy Street. Um, 
basically literally used to have a flat off uh, Great Titchfield Street, which is off Oxford Street right. in London. It was oh, wow. so central, it was ridiculous. Wow. Um, and That's it was really well simple. to get that. And oh yeah, if he kept that now, it'd be worth about three million. Yeah, probably. But yeah. I think I think um, it was quite cheap. When, well, cheap fish is when he got it, but um, they used to go around there to meet him. And we'd go for a drink or whatever. I tell you what, pub opposite him. I remember going in there with him once and we got free beer. Really? Um, really? We, 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 yeah, we were like, oh, that, that's all right, isn't it? <laughs> but then that was, but then that was met afterwards. It was spoiled a little bit when these blokes lobbed a fish head at someone over the street. It was, <laughs> I don't know what was Not going up. on there. So it, we just a slap like that, and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> said, someone just threw a fish head at that. Yeah, <laughs> odd. That is a typical sort of thing that would happen to Carl, just in his yeah. world, like someone throws a fish at <laughs> someone else. Or I'm sort of jealous or, that this happens for Carl and not for me. That yeah. sounds like the best life ever. A lot of the time, we just walk around London I just, and I'd, I'd force him to walk into shops with me to see what he'd say. Like I'd, I'd say, let's go in this art shop. And, <laughs> and you know how art sometimes is a bit conceptual and it's yeah, like yeah. bits of like sweet wrappers and that. Yeah. He would just say the most funniest things and I would just have to walk out of the shop because... I couldn't face this very posh person trying to sell this high-end art and Carl's talking about it like someone's nan's just popped it together and popped it in the window. And that's like, right, I'm out of here, Carl, I can't take this. Sorry, I digress. I've gone off a bit there. No, that's fantastic. Your digressions are great, honestly. It's very interesting. Um, I mean, do you you find Carl, like, it's it's an obvious question. When, When Carl was at school, when you were at school with him, was he funny then? Did you, did you, sort of detect a funny yeah. in him you, and that is kind of you can still see today or is it entirely kind of as he became more aware of himself he became funnier he was like that at school it's very um he was popular in a very small circle of people and mm. he wouldn't let any other people in really all the girls like oh did they all oh, really the girls, he met, yeah yeah but he never went near he never had a i don't remember him going out of any of them he could have done yeah, um, but he used to have like hair like mine. He used to have like a flick, kind of kind of thing, and we just meet in class. And because he was quite funny, the reason why we were funny, I was talking to him about this the other day about why were we like that? Because we were just always making people laugh. And I think it was because what well, one, we were very close friends to the cock of the school. So like the hardest lad in the school yeah. used to sit next to us in form. So if you made him laugh, there was a good chance you weren't going to get your head smacked yeah. or something <laughs> coughed around. You know, around the head smacked. Because it yeah. was likely that if you saw him in the day, walking down the corridor, he'd just beat you up. Like, you know, so if we, if we knew him and made him laugh, then there was a good chance he'd be all right with us and if we're, and we'd be protected kind of thing. So there was an yeah. element of that at school. But then, like, Carl had quite, you know, he had brothers and sisters, so, you know, and they were older than him. He kept his humour, and um, it was a good thing for him, really, because, you know, it's quite hectic family life. But, yeah, he's still pretty much... He was funny at school. The teachers found him funny. The girls found him funny. Yeah. And he used humour to not get his head kicked in on occasion. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it worked out for him, really. I mean, he doesn't, if you notice, like, a lot of the times when Ricky Gervais has a go at him on the XFM podcast, he doesn't retaliate straight away. He uses humour yeah. to get out of an awkward yeah, situation where, where Ricky, you know, some people might react quite badly to that, you know, being called an absolute moron, you know, mm. quite seriously. You'd snap, yeah. wouldn't you, if that was like, a, if I, would, yeah. I would. So, you know. He's able to, after a lot of experience, just shrug that off and just come back with a little bit of humour. You know, he was always like that, you know, since a kid, really. And does he still do that today, like, just day to day when it's not on air? Is that kind of how he reacts to being insulted or, you know, does he use humour in that way in his actual life? Yeah, but he does it a little bit more to get back at you. Like, say, for instance, you know, Mm. I was to piss out of him about something then he would turn it on me and make it funny. So, you know, Mm. he'd have an exact... He's very good at remembering what things people have done, what their names are, how they behave, 
and things like that. So he's able to use them humorously as a kind of weapon back. And it's, it's quite clever, but... It's terrifying. That is, it's great to have a memory like that. Obviously, a, a lot of others, we're, we're kind of encapsulated in this bubble of like the radio shows between 2002 to 2005. And I think a lot of us, I don't know, I, I sometimes feel nostalgic about things. Does, does Carl ever feel sort of nostalgic about that time working at the radio or a particular time of his life? Yeah, he does. I mean, he likes the kind of more simplistic things in life in that he doesn't like hassle. And he often says that, he, you know, like I said to me recently, he puts a price on hassle where if you can pay someone to just not have hassle, he will do. And he doesn't care how much it is kind of thing. He just, and he does look back on things, the more simplistic life that he had maybe as yeah he looks upon it okay i guess i mean i think he does i think he was talking about when he gets older he might do a paper round yes um, I, I, ricky says that i think of one of the episodes like if i could if i could pay you 10 grand a week to do a paper round and it's on the m25 would you do it it's a simple life you know paper round delivering papers perfect for carl I mean, I ended up getting his paper round. I, in, I inherited it. He, he had the best one. And he was on a, these flats called Round, I think they were called Round Thorn Court. And it was a big, big set of flats. And, um, you know, you got there quite early in the morning and you had to use the buzzer to, to wake up people to, to let you in. It was a bit awkward because sometimes you, you know, you wouldn't want to press those buttons. You press them and you'd get some like, oh, I don't want you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then our mate from school, it was funny, I heard a rumour and I said to Carl, you know Peter Woods, well apparently he was caught taking his shit off the top of those flats. And I said, the police caught him and, 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 and Carl said, how did he get caught? Was he reading a fucking paper? <laughs> you know, so, so, but, you know, that's, that's strange. So you, you might need to edit that out. It's a bit. No, funny, it? but, <laughs> On that, on the fact that, you know, he'd love to do a paper round in some ways again. Do you think if Carl could press a button and have had none of the, not not have had Ricky Gervais walk in to that show at that time and have had none of the things that have happened to him since, but still now he has his cup of tea, he has his fish and chips, he just has a very simple life. Do you think he would swap that back? Or do you think he's actually secretly quite likes what's happened? No, I think he likes what's happened. He talks with great fondness about what he calls, quote, his travels. And that's 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 the way he puts it. He doesn't talk about when I was doing. I mean, he does say the occasional the idiot, you know what I mean? The idiot. Mm-hmm. But he, he talks about it like his travels. And more than often, you know, recently he's been talking about it like it's so long ago. And just bring yeah. it up so long ago, and um, yeah. people was. still talk about it like it was yesterday and stuff like that. And he was, if people come up to him, he's going, "What are you listening to that for? It was ten years ago. It was fifteen years ago, or whatever." He, he does want to just always kind of move on to the the mm. next thing to try and make something work. I think he's very interested now. Well, he has been yet yeah, shown himself to actually happen. So he really wants to be an actor. I think. Oh wow! He doesn't, he, he doesn't care if he gets ten quid for it. I was gonna say Shane Meadows gave him like a blinding review for Sick of It, saying that he would love to work with him, and you can so see him fitting into that universe of the Shane Meadows, that sort of grim up northness kind of. Um, oh, absolutely! I think he'd love great, to do great that. realism, yeah. like kind of like I imagine him in something like a Kez or something, yeah. you know, done yeah. by Shane Meadows. I think he'd love that. I mean, I don't know if he could pull that off, but... Um, <laughs> I think yeah. he could. Kez 2021, the remake, <laughs> starring <laughs> Carl Pilkington. No, but yeah. Ricky does say, and he says, he, he Ricky jokes about Carl quite a lot on on air and obviously takes the piss. But one thing Ricky does say on the XFM shows is, actually, Carl, I genuinely think you'd make a, a good actor. And there's these little bits Carl puts together, he puts himself in a film. And he's only, like you know, 10, 20 seconds long. And it's not mm. proper acting, but it's, you can tell during the listening to those clips that actually he is genuinely a good actor. He's able to kind of portray something that is that is not reality 
quite well so I can understand I'm, but I didn't know he was so interested like that that's what he would love to do more than anything else yeah I think so I mean he's not very good with lines he's got a short term memory so he has to write the lines in front of him and he has to look at them browse them and then he'll generally speak what he thinks is there yeah I mean when I went to the screening of the sick of it I thought mm. the scene of Carl where he was talking to the doctor mm. um, was very good. There was a good big close-up of Carl's face, so he couldn't get away with bad acting. Mm. Like, literally couldn't get away with it. And I just thought he performed really well, and I told him, I thought, that was brilliant. I said, you can act now. I mean, he, he can act when he wants to, so I don't see him you know, not having a problem with it. It's just his lines he needs to remember. <laughs> Yeah, but, so yeah. real though, isn't he? So such such a real, like natural performing. Like that. That's why I think he'd fit so well in that world because that social realist kind mm. of Ken Loach world. Like he's so, and the way he, he talks, he about can convince life. you of something very. He can convince you what he's saying is true very well. I think that comes across on the, the XFM shows, and also sick of it. Yeah, absolutely. I think at the moment there there's more of a, a call for. I mean, this is me and Carl speaking. There was more of a call for animation than there was actually mm. live stuff because of the times that we're in at the moment mm. with mm. COVID and what have you. Yeah, he was saying that, you know, friends of his that were making films and stuff, they were just saying it's like a a surgery. You know, every you know the actors have got to stay with each other for a certain period of time or stay in a bubble and then they can come together to do the scene and then they're socially distancing. It's just like a so it's clinical it's yeah. not even enjoyable for the no. people making films horrible. yeah so till this stuff stops then maybe it might pick up for the acting industry in that sense you know mm. um, has that been just again. personally for you good as good for you as an animator during this time has it kind of have you find work sort of flourishing at the moment or? yeah i mean i do i'm always doing stuff yeah constantly working on animations branding companies and all kinds of stuff so it's not let off for me um so that's good yeah Kyle can pick and choose what he does I've read stories of you know him getting huge deals that he can just sort mm. out in imagine. a couple of days I can imagine yeah and like they are huge sponsorship deals and he just goes nah you're all right and he just leaves it because it's not what he wants That's to do. Such integrity, it. though. Oh yeah, but you, you know, I've thought about it. It's, it is, in, yeah, it, it is in the sense of it could ruin his brand. It could ruin his image, you know. We'll so, give him a million pounds or whatever, but he chooses. <laughs> he chooses the. He chooses kind of his realism. Yeah. Really, so yes. money and that kind of thing is is not really interested in going down there and doing that. So. <laughs> Good for him, kind of thing, you know. With me, I'll be like, give it here, I'll have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Hello, I'd like a slice of that pie, please. Please, um, Laurie, we've kept you. I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't want to keep you too long. We've had you for an hour now. It's been fascinating, Mars. I don't know if there's anything else you want to ask I, or. You... I was gonna. No, I ha- absolutely have to wrap up. Thank you so much, Laurie. I've really, honestly, I've really yeah. enjoyed this chat. This has been one of the most, this has been the, my highlight of my week. At last, to, as a sort of end though, I wanted to sort of ask you, what is the appeal, do you think, for Carl, for so many people who are people, people who listen to this podcast or who, who still religiously listen to the XFM podcast, what is it about the sort of Carl Pilkerton character that keeps that passion alive? Like, why has he maintained such sort of longevity in people's memories? Yeah, um, I think, first of all, a lot of people can relate to his kind of thinking. Although it's not always as straightforward as some of the answers that we might relate to. They're they're often quite obscure, but I think we can relate to his thinking and the way he um, he sees the world. And sometimes he does see the world in quite a kind of like childlike, mm. unmessed with view. You know, so I think there's that. I think humour is is a great thing. And um, if people if people laugh at what you're trying to say and what you're trying to get across. And um, sometimes he's not even trying to be funny, and he's funny. So, you know that that's always a good thing, also. But why? But why do? But why does he stick in people's heads still? And says that I, I don't really know. There's it's kind of a mystery, really, to me. Why some people with comedy, it's usually kind of short lived. Mm. 
And he's not really a comedian. He's just no. A, no. a character or a personality, if you like. So he still seems to, you know, attract people that like what he does. Um, yeah. And in particular, the animation that we recently did, people just loved it. They wanted more of it throughout lockdown and, and onwards. And maybe we will do more and that he can write more stories. I hope stories so. For people. I hope you do. Certainly hope you do. More experienced stuff. We may do. We may do. Um, do uh, it. Uh, Go on, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, We want um, more. One more like tiny little thing. Sorry, I'm so excited yeah. right now. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, this is been I'm really happy. You, you're the, the 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 bit where a lot of people know you and your your name from was um from the creepy house where you stayed with the used condom and the dead flies. Yeah, and... yeah, that's right. So me, so around that time, me and Carl were shooting the Four Minute Wonders for Channel Four, which yeah. is the things that like the fridge and stuff. And yeah. then um, I found this spooky house. Well, I asked my girlfriend at the time, I was living in Swindon, let's find a cheap property <laughs> to rent. And she said, I found this mansion. <laughs> and it's like, it's like got 126 rooms, right? We're guardians for it. It's empty. What? And it's a hundred pound a month. And I was what? like, right. So you can, you, can, you can search it. It's called Tottenham House and it's in Savanac Forest in the middle okay. of uh it's like the second largest privately owned uh forest in europe oh, wow. and, and it's huge anyway so the the driveway is like a mile long it's meant to get it and then carl comes around he's like what the fuck is going on here <laughs> so we just go around and stuff like that and uh, there was a deer park we'd have barbecue me and carl had that barbecues in the deer park with with the viscount which was the Lord's son, and uh, the Viscount was just like, he's cool, you know, he's just really cool oh, really? guy, and he was just like, yeah, man, let's go, and let's get a barbecue, and you'd see him about sometimes. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a Viscount. No, <laughs> no he right. kind of didn't act like one. Yeah, he didn't act like one, to be honest. But and then uh, Carl said, you know, let's film this, let's film this, and then we went in a few rooms, and we started finding the weirdest shit, and I was like, look, I don't really want to do this Carl and he's just like no no let's go in here let's go in here yeah and that's where he found these signs there was these yeah there was some odd signs knocking about and lists about babies and stuff and oh, it was like, that's so creepy it was just weird and all these flies there were so many flies <laughs> and I think I don't know if it was down to there were like dead rats in the floorboards or something I mean I mean he was sleeping in my room and like there were there, there were uh, it was just mad. It was like flies knocking about, um coming out of floorboards. Uh, it was just odd. And there was a horror film filmed in there <laughs> with like trigger from Only Fools and Horses. Oh really? Pre- Roger pre- like that. I know, I I've never heard of, it's a bit weird seeing Trigger in a horror film. On a budget like a, as well. It sounds yeah. like it's on a budget. <laughs> yeah, and there was this red splash over near where Carl's bed was. And he's always just like sniggering to myself. That's where that guy got his head chopped off or whatever. Radio, apparently Radiohead uh, recorded Rainbows, their album there. Oh, really? Then, really? Yeah, in the library. And then after it, they met up with Ricky Gervais at a concert. And they I said they to Ricky, that. they said to Ricky, we've been in that hotel. Well, sorry, we've been in that mansion where Carl found the flies and we've actually <laughs> found the room and like Tom York. <laughs> Tom York, like, locating this room where we'd found these flies with a rubber Johnny. Ridiculous. <laughs> so Tom York, he, he, he recorded <laughs> you nude in the uh, in the dead fly room. Yeah, he could have done. He could have done, you know. The, the, yeah, it was a spooky, spooky house, and it was very big. Uh, it's still there to this day. It's owned by a couple of um, millionaires now. They squabble over it and what they're going to. I mean, that could I mean, eat money, that place. You don't fancy going back there at all? Uh? I mean, no. I mean, it's probably still a wreck, I think. It's probably still a wreck. It's probably worse than what it was. I know the roof was leaking last time I had, but... Um, You're supposed to be caretaker for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like he called, I just looked after it. You know, you can see me on the video talking in the background, but I'm kind of just looking after it. I just locked the door, then occasionally yeah. you get some mentalist, like, breaking the door and getting in and I'd go excuse me what are you doing they go oh and then they'd go off but, just um, lock the door remove the condoms from the yes yeah. <laughs> and go to bed see you later and there he was that's Laurie I mean wow uh quite a guy 
um so it's such a so fascinating to get the insight into some one of the very few people in the world who kind of knows who knew Carl growing up knows him now is friends with him it was just it was a ple- it was a pleasure and I think that um hopefully Laurie kind of enjoyed doing it as well and we we certainly did I know we've chatted since and you're a bit you're a bit hyper Miles yeah I am um... I have to apologise to everyone. I was laughing like an absolute gibbon. That was very, very insightful. That was that was great. I, I loved, I loved talking to Laurie, particularly those early early anecdotes about, you know, growing up in Manchester and and the school days. And I hope that we've got something that um the listener can really sort of take away and get closer to, you know, Kawa and you know the xfm shows what what he was like it was it was it was a fantastic revelation yeah it was it was it was really good to get his insight i mean he started off with you know about the story of them getting climbing over the bakers and eating the cakes you know it's nice to hear those sort of stories confirmed you know not not that i i kind of doubted them but it's interesting that you know laurie was actually there when these stories mm. were happening laurie was there you know so it's it's really good to get laurie's take on it and he's a really nice guy like um we've done a few interviews now really i like laurie and uh well uh, and i'll say on air and off air because we spoke to him off air as well very very nice guy yeah and I, yeah, yeah and as miles says i hope you enjoyed it and got something from it and uh you know um we did our best with it we asked the questions we thought you know would would want to be asked we didn't plan it we don't plan these interviews really we don't kind of have a list of questions mm-hmm. because we prefer the natural kind of you know flow of chat so yeah hopefully we did a good job well hopefully it was all right and yeah let, let us know online let us know tweet us all the usual ways yeah and you could do all of that by tweeting us at oh, spinners okay. podcast well, uh, Tweet us at tweet us at um, the the D uh, tweet library. Got to get it right, Gary, or on our email, which is spinnerspodcast at gmail dot com. Hope you enjoyed the show, guys, and we'll see you again soon.